The Writer's Journey, the show where we are on a journey to learn more about writing success together. Bah. So thank you for joining us. I'm your host, Vaughn Moore, and with me is the fabulous Keaton Williams. And tonight we're talking about how to approach a subject matter expert when you are researching for your book. Our guest tonight has been on both sides of that conversation. As a military science fiction author, he's done quite a bit of research himself, but as a 20-year veteran, a ranger a weapons expert, dog handler, martial arts trainer, publisher, and podcaster, he's become a source of first-person experience for a lot of authors in the science fiction community and beyond. Walt Robillard, welcome to the show. I admit to nothing. (laughs) I'm so glad to be on the show. Sorry, go ahead. All the the shenanigans. Very good at admitting to nothing, but thanks for joining us anyway. Cool. Thanks for having me. (laughs) Yeah, to talk. If I have to do a hip throw, the only one close enough to do that too is a is a cat, and that doesn't look nearly as epic as you might think. <laughs> I'm picturing though all the gifts. The oh yeah. Oh yeah, I've body slammed an animal once or twice in my time, you know, and it never works out like you think. So if you have a scene in your book where you need an animal body slammed, you know who to go to, who to talk to. It's Walt. Just remember, if you're gonna be dealing with an animal in your book. Never pull away from the animal. Always push toward. Very important. Ooh, there you go. Everybody write that down. Jot mm-hmm. it. Take the notes. Note taking time. Now, well, I was trying to remember back the first time we met. And the first time we met on Facebook, it was a conversation where I was telling you about the first book I'd ever written. It's historical romance. So I'm thinking romance. I'm thinking the girl on her journey, but she goes west to the Wild West where there are guns. And I have a whole scene where there's a shoot 'em up scene. And I write out the scene and I am confident that the scene is not working. I so, loved that scene, just so that you know. So in our chat, I was like, please, you're an expert in two things. I need some help from you. First, you're an expert romance in romance in the West. Yes. I got this gun scene. And also, I don't think my men sound like proper yeah. masculine men you are a man you're an expert in manly voices can you please look at this scene for those two things guns and then you read it and you're like it's fine it's okay it's great it all works i gotta tell you um there was a um the, the scene that she's talking about uh there is a very tense moment um and those tense moments and a very nice eyebrow quirk by the way um there was a very tense moment and in that tense moment everybody's arm um there is the potential for real violence. And there's this situation where one of the main characters comes in and there's a voice of reason. And then all of a sudden, absolute goddamn mayhem. And I loved it. Oh, was uh, that the, the store, the store? Scene? Don't, yes. Don't spoil it though. Cause when she comes out with this book, all, all people must read it and be awed. Right. But I was just like, that is not what I expected. And that is absolutely what you could expect in an altercation like that, because they never go like you think. Because people are so erratic, one thing or another can set a person off, and then that's that. I mean, so yeah, that was that was a very well done, a very well done scene. So especially in regards to the weapons being used and stuff like that, because uh, old west, those those large, they used very large calibers. Um, most of them were like forty five, uh, sometimes point four eight, a lot of thirty caliber, and some of the weird stuff. Um, so like uh, you know, you're talking a third of an inch for the size of a bullet in thickness, uh, a 45 is almost half an inch. Uh, so, I mean, you're, you're, that's a very big piece of metal coming at you at usually a decent rate of speed. So they cause a lot of damage. And I thought it, I thought it translated very well on the scene. So yeah, that was cool. Yeah. And, and those guns can be pretty inaccurate. I, I know, but I know very little about guns. I think I've shot one once. Uh, so I, the one thing I did know is I needed to go to someone who understood guns, who understood the time, and could kind of give me some feedback. So, you know, audience, maybe that's you. You're you're writing out your plot. You understand that in this plot point, uh, you need some help. You need to go to an expert. So tonight's show is about how to find those experts and then how to uh, efficiently use your time and their time to get the information that you need. Um, so Kaylee and Walt, uh, that's my story, but can you think about a time you were writing a story and you knew you had to go to a subject matter expert? Um, who did you go to and how'd that go? Uh, Kayleen, did you want to go first? Um, well, Black well, Actually, uh, my current collaboration, actually, I'm going to, because that's the one 
that is most recent in my brain mass because I'm all over the place today. Long story. Um, you know, I've never been in the military. You know, um, I've, uh, you know, read a lot of space sci-fi stuff, but, you know, as far as, as that, like, inner workings of military mindset, you know, um, how they address each other, you know, whether it's on the battlefield or in privacy, um, how they kind of, like, joke around with each other. So there's there's this particular scene I was determined, de-freaking-termined to... Um, have one of the Marines giggle. Drove Frisbee absolutely bonkers. Marines don't giggle. <laughs> you can't giggle. So, but I worked it in a way where I could get her to giggle. So I'm super excited. Um, and yeah, so it, so taking that into account, I just didn't willy nilly, you know, have a giggle in there. It's just the personality that I really wanted for this particular character. You know, she would have those moments of, you know, giggly, giggling mayhem. And I wanted that to be able to be plausible in, you know, that warring space marine force recon uh, scenario. And it took a couple times, a few times, um, but I finally got it to work. So, I mean, in that, in that respect, um, honoring you know what marines really are and then trying to fit in a very drastic character personality trait in there um was i think i hopefully it comes out it comes out good so such sub subject matter expert over there 20 years working with the rangers do marines giggle are they allowed to do that uh just a, a quick yeah. clarification i wasn't with the rangers for 20 years <laughs> So, but um, the uh, in my experience, uh, much like uh, the comment by Jay Clifton Slater, um, oh, excuse me, Jay Clifton Slater, author, uh, Marines do giggle, but you don't want to know the subject matter. That is usually true. It usually involves three things, explosives, near misses uh, or attempts on their lives and strippers. So there will be giggling. It's just not in stuff that you want you ever want to be exposed to. Um, uh, the giggling I usually encountered uh, when dealing with Marines were usually either the close co uh, close call type or the uh, or the explosives type. Um, I know that uh, I saw this really great video that scared the crap out of me. Uh, we were in Iraq, and uh, my wife was also deployed at the time. Uh, she was about three hundred kilometers away from me, and. Uh, um, she sends me a video and I'm like, Oh, I'm going to get a cute little video message from my wife. She's going to tell me how, you know, that she's safe and everything's fine. And, and she loves me and I click and there's the back of um, an MRAP, which is a mine resistant vehicle. And this door swings open and there's this Marine. He sticks his head out, looks left and right, waves to my wife who's filming this and then disappears back in the vehicle. He comes back out again, carrying this little Johnny Five looking robot. He drops it down and the robot happily just saunters around the vehicle. You lose sight of it for about 30 seconds. And I'm like, if this is what I think it is, I am gonna be so pissed, right? <laughs> the robot comes back, the door slides back open again. He picks up the robot, waves to the camera like he's you know at Disney. He's just waiting for the line for Space Mountain. It's fine. He shuts the door. Another 10, 15 seconds goes by, and uh, there's a 60, 70 foot mushroom cloud explosion that fills the screen, sends debris everywhere. And all you can hear from the Marines in the vehicle with my wife is this insane giggling. And I'm like, are you freaking kidding me? You know, and I'm just like, oh my God. Because I mean, there's procedures when you're dealing with explosives. And, uh, you know, most of the time, the guys that, you're, that are doing this, they're all explosives ordnance disposal, so they're very well trained. They might look like absolute clowns doing what they're doing, um, but they know what they're doing. Uh, we we had to sit on a bomb one time, and uh, it was um, it was uh, I don't know if I should really say what it was, but I mean it was inert. So we came up to it. The explosives guys determined it was inert, but didn't tell us this. So they come back and they're like, yeah, there's more than we thought. You guys got shovels? We're like, whoa, whoa, whoa. You're going to be striking the bomb or around the ground around the bomb with shovels? They're like, well, unless you got pickaxes. We're like, what the frick, <laughs> guys? 
So then they walk and they expose one of these things. And, you know, we're looking from binoculars because we're way away. If one of these goes off, you don't want to be anywhere near it. And they start kicking it, like to move it over. And I'm like, oh my God. Oh my God. I, I need to pee. I'm old. I need to, you know, and you're just like, what? Now, granted, you don't know all these little facts at the time that the, the, the ordinance was disarmed, blah, 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 or how long it had sat, what conditions it had sat in. I mean, there's all sorts of things where um, an explosive can go off for no reason at all, or to you, what seems to you for no reason at all. But to us, you know, we're sitting there later having lunch with these guys, and they're laughing their asses off that our jaws are on the floor, and we're like, oh, I need to change my pants, you know, because this you can get seriously hurt, you know, or worse. And these guys are just, I mean, you got, you got, it's, it's a bunch of Navy guys, right? So uh, I'm sure, I'm sure Mr. Frisbee will know exactly what I'm talking about and who I'm talking about. You know, the kind of guys that, that don't have like their last names on their shirts. Instead, it's like Bill, Dave, <laughs> Robert, you know, and, and they're just kicking bombs and we're like, oh my God, I'm going to die. You know? So, I mean, um, so, but that sounds like a good case of um, don't break the rules until you know what the rules are. Correct, and 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 uh, it, it's the same thing for dealing with a marine who's giggling. If you if there's a marine who's giggling, you can almost guarantee something is going to come around at some point and bite you. Be it the explosive, the near call bullet, or the stripper. So yeah, I would I would call this one. Um, she really should not be doing what she's currently doing because of where they're headed, but she does it anyway, and it just totally tickles her fancy. Mm -hmm. Yep. Uh, and if you ever want to know anything about explosives, of course, we can always uh, grab our friend, uh, the Supreme Overlord boss, Josh Hayes, who was an explosives expert with the uh, police department he served with. Right. There you go. There's another name for all you listeners. Uh, if you have explosive questions, I'm sure Josh wouldn't mind and just remember, think. Josh likes really expensive coffee. So <laughs> if you want him to do a favor for you, make sure you grab some Black Rifle coffee or Alpha coffee or something similar and bribe the shit out of him. Because that I'm sure that, that works. Would work. That would work. <laughs> so these are the kinds of stories that uh, an author could incorporate into their book if they were to come to you with the right question, get you talking, get these stories out. These are the exactly. And, and that's the thing too, because a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of, uh, there's a lot of misconception out there and most of it has to do with media. And this is why you should do your research. You look at guys like um, Jason Onsbach and Nick Cole, they are extremely well-researched um, partly because Nick himself uh, was, uh, had served in the military as an officer. Um, and Jason had family who had served in World War II, Korea, Vietnam, and and uh, heavily, heavily researched current conflicts, like stupid amounts of research. Uh, and you can find authors like that throughout really great literature. Like, for example, Tom Clancy is one of the best examples. Guy never served a day in his life, right? Oh. But his military structures, the way the stories were, the way he, the, the characters interacted with each other for the time, the 1990s, if you read them now, they're a little bit dated. They, you know, the, the British guys say things like old boy and stuff like that. And you're not going to get that kind of, that kind of like familial, um, you know, Tolkien-esque language out of a Brit these days. You know, they're probably more likely to say fucker all or, you know, uh, any, any of the numerous things that they say when you're working with, uh, especially guys like the, the Royal Para, you know. Um, but, if you, but being well-researched, as long as you're doing your research, that's fine, right? But having some of those firsthand accounts, like, like even the little stuff that, that makes a unit seem more like a family, if you're talking about military structure, um, for example, uh, if you're gonna if, if you're gonna talk about like getting ready to go on a on a deployment, one of the huge things they talk about all the time is first aid. Teaching people um, uh, in a, a service uh, in the civilian world, it's called emergency lifesaver, and uh, it's the first level before you start going into your EMT classes. In the military, they call it combat lifesaver. So um, when you're taking this thing, one of the things they teach you to use is a nasal pharyngeal. Right, it's a small tube, right, that can be inserted into the nose to bypass the airway in, in the event that the airway is clogged, right. And we always pick some poor private that is probably not deserving of this. We lube that sucker up, and we usually try and see if we can get both nostrils 
o'clock okay. on those things, right? Um, uh, see me after the show. I have pictures, and they're declassified, so we got you covered, fam. But I mean, um, yeah, I mean, little things like that, you know, or or like, uh, you know, the time that uh, you know you're learning to, uh, you're you're in doing rollover drills in a vehicle. And they have a mock Humvee, just the body, no tires, no anything, suspended in the air. And everybody gets in, and this thing flips upside down, so that you can see what it's like in the event of a rollover. Because they're um, once they added armor to these vehicles, it changed the weight distribution. These things flip very, very easily. So this this once very agile off road vehicle, the second you add armor, uh, becomes a rollover nightmare. Right. Mm -hmm. So in the event that you're going to be in something like that, you know, what was that experience like? What was that training experience like? Did and does anybody ever talk about the fact that so and so has this scar across his lip from the ammo can that he didn't lock down like he was right. supposed to? And when the truck tipped over, it slashed him in the face and he had to get three stitches. Right. So I mean stuff little things like that can 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 it doesn't have to be the fact that, you know, your your sergeant is this way and your colonel is this way and you know the difference between um a, you know, the Navy ranks, the Air Force ranks, and the Army ranks, you know, I mean, it, it doesn't have to be that in depth, but you should definitely research. And if you have somebody with firsthand experience, absolutely talk to them because 90% of the time, um, they're dying to share their stories with somebody, you know, um, it, usually, uh, in the event, it's, it's been my experience that most special operators will talk to you one on one, but do not want to be quoted directly. Um, so if you're looking to talk to guys in things like JSOC, SOCOM, uh, uh, MARSOC, like all these all these pairs of socks that you, you that people put on their feet, right? Um, and it's just different versions of the Special Operations Command uh, in the Department of Defense, right? They will usually try not to go on record about certain events, but they can give you generalities. Um, but I think that the, the the thing that research does is it takes away from poorly it, it, it takes away the power of poorly researched properties, right? And the best example of that is somebody holding a gun like this next to their head, right? Mm -hmm. And the reason that it came about is during the 1970s, televisions had a certain frame, right? Oh. So you, nobody, under, nobody went to a subject matter expert back then. They just said, listen, we can't see the gun and the gun is exciting. It builds yeah gun is in the scene. So if the gun is in the scene, put it next to the person's face so it's in the frame of the television. The problem with that was it started filtering into other police departments who started doing that. And the LAPD caught wind of it, and they started sending their SWAT units all around the country saying, hey, stop that. That is stupid. Don't do that. Right? Because if the gun accidentally goes off or you get pushed up against a wall like that and discharge the firearm, now you're deaf. You're deaf, uh, the flash is right next to your face, so you could get a muzzle burn. You know, I mean, there's tons of things that can go wrong with having this thing up here near your grill, you know, and it's that kind of stuff, you know, that, that movies get wrong all the time or like um, somebody pulling the trigger repeatedly when a, when a firearm is empty. The only, re the only thing that that really works with is a revolver. Mm -hmm. right? And if you pull it twice and so something doesn't happen, throw the goddamn thing away or reload it. You know, I mean, so it's it's little things like that where in people who know what they're doing will read or um, or will will see that property and just be like, oh, really, you know, um, but subject matter experts, you know, um, you look at guys like uh, Mark Wahlberg in uh, his like uh, pump you up movies uh, that he did with like the rock and stuff like that. Right. They, they researched CrossFit. They researched the whole nutrition circuit. You know, they talked, the rock was already, um, uh, you know, well established in nutrition and fitness and all this other stuff. And, and then they established himself by talking to bodybuilders back then. So, I mean, you, if you talk to those first hit people with firsthand experience, it's going to take a lot of power away from that crap media, especially like, Oh, if I hear one more person, or read one more account of somebody saluting somebody in the field or screaming, yes, sir, you know, to a sergeant or something like that. It's like, dude, it takes five minutes. Go on the internet and research a rank structure, you know, um, stuff like that. It just, you, you don't, in most properties, you don't need to be so researched that it's, it's, becomes almost like an object lesson or a class. But at the same time, you want it to have that authentic feel. 
have that authentic feel, but make sure you, you do your research and, and you don't necessarily need a subject matter expert. Sometimes these experts write books and you can read those and get a lot of information from them. So yeah, there's a lot you can do to kind of defray that, that bad media that has come before. Yeah, or make they make YouTube videos and you can look it up on YouTube. Yeah, oh, subject matter experts. I yeah, well, there's both sides of the coin too, because you know, then there's that guy who's like rolling on the ground with a live firearm, like he's. That's true. You're like, what, dude, what are you doing? And that's when you continue to research, and then you know, the odd duck out is probably the one that's lying to you. Oh my god, it's just like, dude, come on! Somebody who doesn't know what they're doing is going to see that and try it. You know, or um, did you guys hear about uh, a few years ago, the redneck body armor test? Mm -hmm. So these two kids, uh, I think it was Louisiana, uh, but I'm not, don't quote me. I'm not looking to insult our fine friends from Louisiana. Um, these two kids just put on a, a section of, uh, I think it was level two body armor and from almost point blank shot each other with a nine millimeter. And it's that like, sounds like a good, a good time. And the, uh, where the round hit wasn't rated for the round they were using and it didn't punch all the way through, but the kid got a, you know, started bleeding from it. Well, you know, luckily the armor held, but uh, he was lucky. <laughs> Darwin yeah. award. It, well, he's, apparently Darwin had the day off that night. So, I mean, <laughs> but yeah, there's a lot of cool research out there. And, and if you talk to somebody, you know, just seriously, Get, get them talking and, and have them share those experiences because some of those experiences are so much fun and add a lot of depth to what you're writing. So making your story more authentic, that's one reason to go to a subject matter expert. Um, also coming up with new plot ideas, character ideas, uh, ways that your characters can grow and change, um, ways, new uh, aspects for your plot and directions for your plot that can come up in this conversation you could have with this subject matter expert. Um, those are great reasons. And, and also to help bring your research together. If you've looked at YouTube videos, if you've looked at information that wasn't accurate, you might not know. <laughs> but in this conversation that you're having with someone one-on-one, -on -one, you might be able to sort through that information to figure out what's useful to you, what's not, what's true, what's not, what should be in your plot and book and what shouldn't. I've had a couple of uh, really cool authors come up and say, "Hey, you know, I know you. I heard you know so and so. Do you mind if I pick your brain for a minute?" And it's it's very humbling to have somebody do that because I mm -hmm. I'm nobody special. I, I you know I just I, I I enjoyed serving my country as part of certain units, and it it was a great career. Um, it allowed me to get educated, allowed me many opportunities to see things I might not have otherwise seen and been introduced to very interesting people I never would have met. Um, and to have somebody come up and say, hey, I would like to use that experience. Um, it, it was really interesting. And, and it's fun to almost relive that education with an author who might not have known something. Like, for example, um, uh, one author said, hey, you know, I'm thinking about having these guys transferring on a ship to another ship. And they're in process when they get rerouted. These are the people on the ship. And I'm like, well, is it like hand wavium science fiction? Or are you trying to emulate a military command structure? And he said he wanted the military command structure. I said, all right, so that guy wouldn't be that rank because in the Navy, that rank is this, and it's way too high for what you're asking for. The guys in here, these three dudes just hanging out, there is no way anybody would let these three dudes at that rank get anywhere unsupervised. <laughs> you know, um, so you might want to include this, this, and this. I said, this person here that you're calling this is not this. It's this other thing. Uh, they were referring to, he's, he's, he said, yeah, the Marine medic. I'm like, no, Marines don't have medics. And he goes, what do you mean? And I said, Marines don't use medics. I said, they have corpsmen. It's actually a Navy sailor that is assigned to a Marine Corps unit. And he's like, what? I said, dude, uh, this is how it is, you know, and uh, ask Bill, he'll tell you, uh, you know, so uh, and always protect your corpsman. Right. So, I mean, 
it's it's one of those things where you know you you almost feel humbled but at the same time you're you're like it, it feels nice to be able to talk about this stuff because that author could have very easily instead of enjoy you know allowing me to enjoy part of my afternoon by talking to an author and going over this stuff he could have gone to the internet and maybe with an hour or two of research uh, gotten the same thing but I mean, it was nice to have that conversation with the author and, and establish that relationship. And that's that's really the benefit of see seeking out a subject matter expert. Um, guys like uh, on uh, the show a couple weeks ago, you had uh, Jonathan and uh, uh, Jennifer uh, Yanez, who are fitness experts. And that's stuff like that is fantastic because not only can they learn about um, how to uh, engage fitness so that you are healthy after sitting at a keyboard all day or, or what have you, unless you're um, last week's uh, author who uh, dictates while hiking in the mountains, that dude's going to be live to be 115, you know, but like, um, but at the same time, somebody who's writing about that level of fitness uh, can now use those notes from that show because you had that subject matter expert on and that's pretty cool. Right. Yeah. Uh, so, one question I had is how do you efficiently use your time and that the person you're interviewing? Because there's so much that they could feed into your book. It sounds like there's so many details that they could fix if they knew what was going on in the story. You're not paying them to edit. You're, they're volunteering their time to have this conversation with you. So what are some things an author can do to get prepared for one of these conversations? And then in the conversation itself to make the best use of the time? Um, I think the, the best thing that they can do would be to um, really understand their limitation. So if you're talking about the military um, and you know nothing, um, a good place to start would be like um, um, uh, several books that are out there on the subject as far as like basic military command structures and basic military uh, operations. What's involved in a basic military operations? If you're talking about a 12-man group versus a 500-man group, what is that called? Start there. It's very easy. And there's a perfect book for that that I can't reach at the moment because my big computer is being a butt. Uh, but what oh, what name does he put on it? William Frisbee Jr., uh, yep. the uh, infantry fragne. Big blue yeah, anyway, that, that book is freaking phenomenal. Uh, yep. I've almost read through all of it, so it's great. Yep. It's got, it's got, yeah, that it, it's got the six-man team, the twelve-man team, you know, um, yeah, I could go on. It's, it's intense. Anyway, sorry. No, please, uh, and you know, yeah, absolutely, pick up that book because uh, I've read it and it's a lot of fun, um, and it shows a a very uh, detailed knowledge of basic infantry as used in science fiction, you know, and and how we can. Uh, uh, take the modern structure that we have in the military today and apply it to a fictional military of the future. But the same is true about any other subject you might you might be approaching. Um, Scott Moon, uh, one of the excellent shows, of uh, hosts of the live show on Mondays, tune in on Keystroke Medium for your, you know, there we go. Uh, but I mean, um, he was talking on uh, the Keystroke Medium group the other day about Nova's um, you know, oh, yeah, these, these big giant, uh, you know, gas streams that are out there in the galaxy. And in one of his, in one of his stories, he said, yeah, you know, they pass through this, this type of Nova. And he was like, yeah, I did some more, more research. Yeah. They would have burned up like a little match, you know? And, and it was, it was, it's very interesting to see what works in science and what doesn't. I mean, the classic example of this is star Wars, you know, in, in space, you don't have noise. And planes don't. I fly recently learned that. I was like, "Oh, okay." Like, yeah. No noise. No, no noise. No, Take out all the noise. <laughs> no noise because it's a vacuum. There's nothing to to for the sound to travel on. There's nothing. There's no air particles to vibrate. So there's nothing to send off the tympanic membrane in your ear. So there's no sound. You know. Um, you know. You know. Oh, 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 the uh, um, but aside from that, the way a, uh, an X-wing fighter or a Tie fighter moves in space is not how that would move in space. A better example, although not totally a hundred percent accurate, would be the current edition of Battlestar Galactica. You know, things if you shoot off in space at this way, at, you know, at, at and accelerate this much, 
in order to slow down or change tra trajectory and, and not be crushed against the fuselage, um, you need to use counter maneuvers to turn and to slow down and to whatever. And it's just uh, the Expanse does does also very similar where they use uh, specialized drugs um, and specialized uh, seating uh, so that you're not crushed against G-forces for from acceleration de deceleration. So um, those that kind of research um, is flawless, uh, not flawless, uh, is, is, is priceless because um, somebody who reads that who's in the scientific community might approach you later and been like, I loved what you did. Can you tell me your research? And if you need further research, Hey, hit me up. I, I loved your story, you know? And now not only are you, you getting more, uh, more intense and, uh, better, uh, or closer to uh, the line of research, but now you also got a fan that you can talk to, uh, and, and who is also excited about your story because you were excited about the science and that's really cool. So before you go to an expert, do your research first. Whether At least a little bit. Wikipedia or you're reading a book, but you're, you're, you're looking and reading and trying to figure it out for yourself. Uh, that'll give you an, a better idea of what questions you want to ask that expert and have those questions prepared before you start that conversation. And then uh, when you're having the conversation, take notes. Is there a way to record conversations so that you could watch it later? Uh, yeah, you could. I mean, just let the guy know you're recording him. Well, uh, yeah, let him know clearly or her know. Um, my uh, like if they have all these stories to tell, like you want to remember them, and there's no way you can. Well, if you're a very good note tech taker, you could, but it'd be very hard to take notes on all these little story details that you might want to put in your story later. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, just ask them first because, uh, especially, um, different states have different rules about recording somebody without their consent. Oh, sure. Uh, I know my my state um, for audio for video it's a one party state for audio it's two party so um, for video you don't need permission to video someone but you do need permission to record someone so yeah it's you're know, very uh, Rhode Island you know it's uh, hey uh, I I got this guy about this thing <laughs> Kayleen you're you're muted we we don't judge I was I was saying uh... oh, God. No, oh no I remember. Um, you can video them, but you have to cut out all the audio. That's what I was saying. There you go. Um, but yeah, I mean, um, you can, yeah, and I apologize to Rick, uh, the conversation involved nebulae and not, uh, Novus. I got my N words backwards. Um, but, um, yeah, just ask him first. Uh, most guys will be amenable to it unless you're talking to somebody who would rather no, not go on record um, about certain instances. They would rather you use vagaries and generalities, um, usually military, uh, especially in some of the alphabet soup communities, um, JSOC, uh, SOCOM, uh, DEA, CIA, um, uh, all those groups. Um, uh, Certain social workers, uh, if you're talking to a social worker, um, they don't, uh, um, they generally don't want to disclose specifics because it's usually viol in violation of several laws. Uh, back in the uh, early 2000s, I went to um, the field office of the FBI in Boston because we were writing uh, an RPG supplement, supplement that um, included the FBI. We wanted to represent them properly. So we went to them. And uh, we uh, contacted their Office of Public Affairs. Uh, they brought us in, uh, gave us a tour of the office, let us talk to several agents. What's the different type of agents, different uh, uh, sectors within, uh, uh, branches within the agency. Um, it was a really great experience. And stuff like that, as, as an author, you can do. A lot of these, these groups have public affairs agencies that um, they want to be portrayed properly. Um, that's why Hollywood has access to stuff like Tom Cruise flying an F-14 Tomcat, you know, because they, they want that positive uh, experience on screen so that people will apply to be a fighter pilot. You know, um, if you go to some place like Fort Benning, uh, the Rangers uh, on Benning, or if you go to some place like, um, um, don't say the name of the camp, Walt. Uh, if you go, <laughs> if you go to um, the Special Warfare Center on Fort Bragg, you know they have outreach groups that will that will talk to you so that these groups are represented properly. Um, same thing for the Marine Corps. 
you know, um, that usually the only thing they ask is that that certain things are left vague, so that things like uniforms can't be ex uh, um, explicitly copied and then used in um, insurgency actions. Um, certain things are usually, uh, especially in uh, in film, are usually altered just slightly so that uh, it it can't be used like a textbook or or, or a class to give a bad guy. Uh, this is how a marine walks, talks, acts, dresses so forth and so on. Uh, but everybody knows, you know, Marines and crayons. So, yeah. Sorry, Bill. I love you. Y'all and your crayons. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so before we continue on, um, I'm going to hit the show sponsor because I just saw that we actually have one. Yay. And tonight is, if I can go back up is brought to you by The Academy, The Survivors Book 10 by Nathan Heisted. The Academy is a galaxy class school created to train the next generation of gatekeepers. Jules Parker is attending the Academy alongside her best friend Patty. When the cold threat oh, sorry, when the cold threaten everything her father and his friends have spent years building, she must reveal that her oh my goodness. Iskios abilities are stronger than ever with magnus and slate away on the horizon and mary working on the board of the alliance of worlds dean finds himself out of the action for the first time he works on a plan to set a trap against the mysterious cold and things culminate as the looming attack grows leaving dean shocked to find someone he trusted has betrayed him the academy is under attack but will it stand when the dust settles Find out in the newest installment of the Survivor's Adventure of Doom. Ooh. Of Doom. Okay, we have a question, and this is a question that Walt, you came up with for yourself. So I, I want to hear your answer for your own question. And the oh question God. is, my first book was panned in the reviews by people who had actually been to X or done Y. Should I fix said book with a subject matter expert, or should I grab one for book two. Um, well, just keep in mind, if you bring in that subject matter expert or do the research, um, your book is going to be vastly different than it was f for the first one. Um, for example, if you have people standing up in the middle of a trench, <laughs> sorry, uh, Bill is now sending me a naughty text messages because I said crayons. Um, <laughs> I can um, only imagine. <laughs> I love Marines. Um, so your book is going to be vastly different. The second book, if you're using a subject matter expert versus if you're it, and the first one that you didn't, for example, if you're talking about World War One and somebody yells out, Corporal, I need you to get to this uh, this line and relay this message. And the guy stands up, salutes and ye yells, "Let yes, sir. In reality, that's a dead dude, right? So right. Um, there's a reason for saluting. It's an old military tradition that dates back to many, many eons ago from across the pond. There is a reason to do it. There is a reason for doing it and when you do it. And you, you th there are instances to absolutely not do it at all. And that's what talking to an expert would would show you so if you have that instance in book one and it doesn't occur in book two and now they're like they're like i'm on it sir or yes sir right away and it's not screaming at the top of their lungs like a basic tranny they're just under fire so the person is being loud that's going to come across you know it's the same thing where if you're talking um if you're writing psychological thriller and in book one the police detective catches that that first criminal who's mentally disturbed and it's garden variety, mental disturbed, you know, SVU garbage. And then you go to you go to book two, where you actually talk to a criminal psychologist or a criminal psychiatrist uh, or a forensic psychiatrist. You talk to these people, and they give you insights into the criminal mind. Your second book is going to be vastly different than your first book. So, what do you want out of that series? Is the first book just your growing pains and you don't really need it. And you just rely on word of mouth to say, just get past book one, wait till you get to book two, or do you go back and rewrite it and then re-release it? You know, because it, it's all going to depend on how you see your series and how linked they're going to be. Because 
once you start engaging a subject matter expert, that person is is going to change how you view the material yourself um, and how you convey it. So, uh, you know, um, I, I assume that with a publisher, the publisher is going to want you to have matching material all the way through and will probably ask you to do a rewrite or, or what have you. But uh, if you're the person publishing it yourself, I mean, if if that's a thing you're really into and, and go back and rewrite it so that it's consistent. Uh, if you don't care about the consistency of your series, then just keep going, you know, and just hope your research gets better and better and better. Uh, but the more research you do, you know, that's the difference between, um, that's the difference between like Mac Bolin in space and Galaxy's Edge. You know, Galaxy's Edge is very popular for a reason. It resonates with veterans because they've done their research. Mac Bolin in space, yeah, I read it. It's all right. You know, or space opera with Space Marine number four in said series Alpha on that certain author that I can't remember. You know why I can't remember him? Dude didn't do his research. You know what I mean? So I mean, it's it, you're gonna have yeah. pros and cons either way. Right. Yeah. Uh, the question kind of makes it sound like there's a person who pointed out, and, and we all have them, right? You know, someone who jumps in on the reviews and gives you a one star because of some specific problem in your in your story that wasn't lining up with their expertise or, or their knowledge. Um, do we listen to that one? Uh, man or woman and make that change or take the book down or rewrite it or do you just say hey most of my readers are happy they love the story as a whole i'm going to move forward how do we make that decision well who, who who made the comment you know is it random guy 238 from amazon <laughs> way to go random guy you pointed out the one thing i did what's your background you know oh well you know the science doesn't bear that okay shows show me the science in your comment give me an actual link something i could follow to make me better you know if i'm if i'm not doing my job as a writer and my um and my and my story isn't living up to your expectation but all these other people like it then you better provide me proof that you know what you're talking about you know and that's and if it's just that one guy that one detractor and it's that it's always that same guy if you have a large portion of of people who are really enjoying the story and then you have one detractor right it usually starts out with i only read 30 percent of this book okay congratulations you got you didn't have the stamina discipline or drive to finish the book and see if the mistake was consistent you know you're giving me you, you didn't do your research about my writing why should i do my research to make you happy you know, um, instead, I have these other legions of fans that I have to um, elevate and aspire to get my writing to a place where I'm pleasing these fans because they're enjoying what I'm doing. One detractor depends on who the detractor is. If it's uh, uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson and he's saying that, you know, your nebulas and novas are mixed up, dude probably knows what he's talking about. That's the guy I'm listening to. But if it's random guy 238, uh-uh. Nope, I appreciate your feedback. I appreciate you read 30 pages of my 380 page book. But um, thank you. Next time. Right. So, so definitely weighing, yeah, definitely weighing a, what, what level of, I guess, realism do you want to have in, in your story? You're writing a military, you know, how really close to that military do you want it to be? Uh, do you want to have some hand wavy on this? Um, or do you want it to be like, really a veteran could read this and um, be like right there, like, dude, it's like I'm freaking reliving an awesome moment, funny scene, what have you. Um, like even in a romance, like your um, your time period, like if it's set in Victorian uh, England, you should definitely do research on England, Victorian times you know, down to the types of dress wear, you know, how, how would a woman walk tied up in a corset like that? They can't sit, which is why they, you never really see paintings of them sitting because it takes a long time. So they always stand, you know, and they're very straight and, you know, just like things like that. Like, yeah. What level of accuracy based on what it is you're writing and what you want to deliver. 
You see that really too in, in a lot of modern uh, interpretations of stories, um, especially in geography. Um, like, for example, if you've never been to New York, right? And you start writing about New York and you got Google Earth and you're zooming in on streets and you're getting the street view and, and stuff like that. But you've never been there. Um, if you've been to a big city, you can fake it, you know, because you understand that that sense of claustrophobia of being packed in with tens of millions of people in a small confined space. But at the same time, do you know that, you know, um, do you get the feeling of the handrail? as you're walking downstairs into Lindy's to get a piece of cheesecake, you know, and, and see all these actors pictures up on the wall, you know, do you get the sense that when you walk over into this particular neighborhood, it smells like pea and peanuts, you know what I mean? It, it, like no, no joke, you know, and, it sounds and awful. <laughs> you know, um, if you've never been to Los Angeles, do you know that, you know, two sections away from this very, robust neighborhood, very well-to-do neighborhood, they have, they are now having problems with entire sections of tent cities, you know, and you wouldn't, you n might not necessarily know these things unless you've been there um, or talk to somebody who lives there. And, and you see that a lot of times in modern stories, people who have not experienced that or, or talk to somebody who has experienced, you know, um, if you've never been on a Japanese subway, you know, but yet you want to, you know, you got this like thriller where something happens on a Japanese subway and you got them running through the car. Dude, they're not running through the car. Okay. Relax. Do read a book. Right. Because the reason they're not running through, through a car is because you're packed in there like sardines and everybody either has a book or a tablet or something in their hands. And it's like, uh, no, they're not, <laughs> they're not sleeping. But like, I mean, you know, you got, uh, <laughs> um the uh, uh you know you got you you got in the in the media they're they're saying oh yeah and this guy was reading this 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 novel and it's like oh, wait a minute uh in if you're talking downtown tokyo and the person is this age demographic they're not reading a novel they're probably reading manga you know and they're doing this and they're doing that and it's little things like that that might tip the reader off to say they were there or they weren't there or what have you um, you know if you've uh, if you've uh, if you've never slept in a person locker you know what i'm talking about right Kayleen? a person the, locker yeah the the oh. little slide in uh, oh. you the tower <laughs> yeah <laughs> The pillows feel like rocks. Lots of <laughs> rocks. Did you did you sleep in one? Yeah, we did. Freaky, right? Yeah, and it's just yeah. this little tube, and it's it's like on a wall, and it's it's like you, you know you slide you you know you, these days you slide your you, you know your card through, or you have an app on your phone that unlocks it. But back in the day, you put in money, and it opened like a wall locker in a train station. You just slid in, shut the locker, it locked behind you, and you fell asleep for a couple hours waiting for your train. And it was like just enough for you to get in there like a sardine, you know. I mean, Kayleen's laughing; she knows, right? Um, so, I mean, you know, the uh, you know these little tidbits that can that can elevate your story to, oh my god, this guy's really been there, you know. Oh my god, he knows that such and such street in New York smells like pea and peanuts, you know. He knows what you know uh, what the open face roast beef sandwich at Lindy's tastes like, and blah 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 blah, you know. So, I mean, it's those little things that when you're when you're talking about stories like that uh just even if you can't experience that if you can't go to like um cambodia and go to the temples out there or you can't go to some place like venice and actually traverse the canals stay away from venice in august oh my god um but i mean you know little things like that will elevate your story and if you can't get there yourself talk to somebody who's been there or read a travel manual read uh somebody who's got first-hand accounts there are people on youtube making entire livings of going to places and staying at resorts going to like different areas and stuff like that and they're doing all this crazy research for you and all you have to do is watch a 30-minute video so it's really neat so how do i approach someone i've never met before but i know that they have the information that i need um, do I find them on Facebook? What should my opening message be like? How do I reach out to this person? Uh, 
I can't really say about like uh, anybody else. I know when people have approached me, uh, it usually has to do with either military stuff or martial arts stuff. Every once in a while, it's a role playing game question or an illustration. Um, it's usually, um, you know, I saw you here. Would you mind answering this question? And that's really, as long as you're polite, I mean, that's really all you really need. Um, I, I've worked with four authors now who've asked me military questions and one author who asked me about a martial arts question. Um, the martial arts questions are a little more difficult because unless I can actually get on video and show you what I'm talking about, I have to go into a long explanation of why you do something. It's, uh, one of the people that approached me was asking about how to choke somebody out. And I'm like, okay, I know this person. So as, as somebody who knows how to do that, uh, I'm not worried that I'm going to be telling them how to do something that they're going to use themselves for, you know, whatever bad purpose. Uh, but at the same time, you can leave some parts of that vague because um, uh, y y you don't need somebody reading to have a step-by-step -step manual on that as well. But like, you know, the person asked, do I just reach up and grab them? And it's like, no, that doesn't work. Uh, it's going to take you at least two to three minutes to strangle the person out how you're describing it. And he's like, well, why? And I said, well, the difference is an airway choke versus a blood choke. Blood chokes are infinitely faster, and this is the reason why. This is how you do it. This is why you would do it this way, and this is how you would, and, and how fast the person would go unconscious. And the shock, you know, the shock from the author was like, is it really that fast? And it's like, the next time I'm on the mat, I will film this for you, and I will show you how fast it works. You know, and so. Yeah, and uh, Rick Partlow, you can see how they do it in an MMA match, you know, because, and it's fast. Rear naked choke, uh, the reason they call it rear naked is because you're behind the person and there is, the neck is exposed. There's nothing to protect the neck from you attacking the blood flowing in and out of the neck. And that's why it's called that. Um, and uh, in Brazil, they call it the lion shirt because your arms wrapping around the head look like the lion's mane. Um, so, I mean, you, but you wouldn't know things like that unless you talk to somebody who knows how to do it, knows what they're doing and, and why you're going to do it. So, uh, but yeah, most of those people have approached and been like, I just got a quick question. And that was, and that was fine. Now we did have a couple of questions for you from our audience from before. Bill hey, Frisbee hey. asks, which is his stronger skill, the guard or passing the guard? <laughs> uh, that depends. Do I want to be there or do I not want to be there? Um, so what he's talking about is uh, in uh, most Brazilian jiu-jitsu and in some cases of Japanese jiu-jitsu, and there are, there are two schools of thought of why you get into this position. Um, so a guard is just you wrapping your legs around the other person's hips. The reason you do this is to control the other person's posture. If they go to pull back their hand to try and punch you in the face, you pull your legs into you and pull them close so you can hold on to them so they can't hit you. Um, if they're close enough to strangle, you can push your hips away, forcing them back so that now they can't attempt that strangle by closing off the shirt to your airway. So, I mean, there's there's tons of reasons why you want to get in or get out of that guard. Um, I would rather pass the guard because now I'm on my way to a mounted position, which is now I'm on top with my, my legs wrapped around their hips. Um, and that affords me a level of control that, uh, you know, is really hard to beat. Um, you hear ground and pound all the time. It usually encounters from the mounted position. And if you go on YouTube and look up MMA, you'll see tons of reasons for that. So I would rather escape the guard than go to guard if I have to. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, if I have to hit the ground, I'm already reaching for, you know, something nasty to stick in their face. So <laughs> I'm getting out of there one way or another. All right. And Anna Johnson asks, how does Walt right on, I don't judge, Robillard, manage his time and do everything? Um, I assume she's talking about writing or is she talking about all the stuff that I've done? I think, oh, um, yeah, yeah, all the stuff that you've done and also writing. <sighs> yeah, there's that. Um, so I don't sleep. <laughs> um, or, or I sleep in graduated patterns. Um, 
Uh, really I, doesn't I, sleep. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, um, but I, I, my grandfather was one of the most influential people on me. He was an immigrant. He was, uh, he became uh, a, uh, he became a business owner in the United States. Um, he, at a very early age, he lied about his age to join the military and fight in war to get his citizenship. <clears throat> Excuse me, allergies. Um, and then, um, does everything physical sound sexual when you talk about it? What the hell, Shadow the Illustrator? Um, so, <laughs> so my grandfather was a very powerful, intra influential man, and he said, "Don't waste any time that you have because there's no concrete guarantee that there's something after this life." So, <clears throat> excuse me, if um, you know, if you if you believe in in uh, in life after death um, and and hold to that belief, then even still, you should make the most out of what you have here because you never know what that next life is going to lead to. So, whether you believe that or you don't believe that, make every day count. Make every day like it's your last because you don't know if you're going to get any more. And if that's the case, you know, I I I always wanted to jump out of an airplane. I always wanted to have and as as mundane a thing as this was i always wanted a dog growing up um i always wanted to swim with cool marine life i mean there were all these things that i learned growing up and i'm like why can't i have that why can't i do that i wanted to speak english like a normal person instead of the rest of my family with this very thick accent you know, and I wanted to learn to draw. I wanted, I wanted to do it all. I wanted to at least try it all, or taste it all, or sample it. Um, and why can't, why can't I have that? You know, why can't I do that? If I have to give up an hour of sleep, <coughs> excuse me, um, so that I can have those experiences, you know, why can't I have that? And that's that's how I try and and put my days together, so that um, somebody teaches me something every day, you know, and it doesn't. <laughs> Jay Clifton Slater, Walt said, cool marine life. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so I want to jump. <laughs> yep, Rick Fartlow. Don't know if this is an afterlife, so I want to jump out of an airplane. Hey, staying in the plane is worse than going out of it. Okay. Landing in a plane in a big metal tube on three struts, that scares the crap out of me. Landing at 20 miles an hour with a soft cushion of air keeping me floating at a constant speed, I'm all set. I'm good to go. You know, but like, um, yeah, I try and I try and, um, and structure my days so I have some creative outlet every day. Um, and most days that I split my time between uh, my RPG business, uh, audio narration, and uh, and writing. Um, the writing I try and get in chunks as the inspiration hits me. I usually hit my phone to type everything up and then um, transfer that later. For the RPG stuff, it usually involves me doing layout or art. Um, and those, I, that stuff I usually do on like a Saturday when I have more time. Um, and then audio narration, uh, I've been doing, I try and get a chapter every day if I can, uh, as work and life allows. Uh, but at the other side of the coin too, I have a great wife. She's very patient with me. She's very um, long suffering because I am not an easy person to live with. Um, uh, much like my dog, I, I have a uh, Belgian Malinois. Um, and like my dog, uh, I'm like um, an attack rabbit on meth. You know, I, I am constantly moving. So it's, it's it, yes, it is very fun to skydive. I've done both uh, skydiving and um, I've done static line jumping for the military. And I enjoy both. Um, so good times. Uh, but I jumped out of helicopter into Hammerhead Nurseries so I could. <laughs> you, sir, are insane. Those sharks suck. Um, but like um there's uh you know measure your time try and get it all in because you only got you, you only got one bite you know savor every time you bring your teeth together because god man you don't know if you're going to be here tomorrow you know what's what's that old line uh better to burn out than fade away you know burn bright every day just live it like you stole it i hope that answers don't actually steal anything <laughs> Except your wonder, your own wonder, and uh, your time. Steal all your time. Steal all your time. Absolutely. I'm making a shirt with that on it. <laughs> um, I feel like I, I 
yeah, I had like no questions, but you know, cause a lot of it comes down to a lot of us have a hard time, like approaching people just in general. Um, and we, I see that question a lot, you know, how do I go up to someone to talk about collaborations? How do I go up to someone to, um, talk about, uh, get finding an illustrator, uh, finding a formatter, um, everything's so awkward, you know, start with hello. I write fantasy. Do you write stuff? Oh, you illustrate. That's really cool. What do you illustrate? I super love dragons and fairies. You know, maybe you'll find find a find a match. And pony space marines. Pony space marines. Yes. Damn yes. straight. It's gonna be a freaking awesome thing. Super excited. <laughs> nice. I think we've I think we've mildly come up with a, a solid name for that that we both like. So are you going to reveal cool. that here, or are you are you going to make us wait? Uh, I don't know. Uh, are you still around, Mr. Frisbee? Are you still around? <laughs> Hello, Frisbee. Yes. All right. All right. Marines, luck, and ura. <laughs> I like it. The I like it. <laughs> yeah, super like it. Anyway. So that's where I'm at. Oh, right. I probably should be saying goodbye now. Did you? Oh, do you have any last comments, uh, thoughts? What was that? I think last thing. Is that the last thing? Um, I would just say that um, um, Jay Clifton Slater, author, said that uh, please say "attack rabbit" on meth in Walt's voice, and that Lauren should do that. Attack rabbit on meth. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, why do I? Why do I feel I'm going to be the butt of many jokes tomorrow? That's what we do here. Yep. Attack All the my butt. Yep. All right. Well, this has been so much fun. Thank you so much for coming on and, and hanging out with us, talking about all your expertise on expertises and whatnot. Uh, is there any particular place people can find you if they want to know about said jujitsuing and choke holding and mounting of the peoples? <laughs> boy that took a weird turn fast almost as cool as uh bill frisbee's uh crayon picture which i will show you guys after um Ooh, uh, yeah they can they can find me at uh hazardstudio.net uh and thanks so much to everybody in the chat who's been hanging out and making fun of me behind the scenes that's been that's been awesome and very humbling <laughs> yes our chat is they're kind of crazy tonight i don't know how to respond in the stream yard um but yeah, y'all were hilarious. And thank you always for coming, hanging out with us, chatting, asking your questions. We try to get all of them in that we can. Uh, and yeah, make sure you hit the subscribe button, ding the little bell, and hit the, isn't there like a like or something? There's like three things you have to do to get notified that we're going to be live. And yeah, be sure to come back next week. We're going to talk about some reading, writing, and everything in between right here on Keystroke Mediums, The Writer's Journey. Good night, Good night. Good night. Good night.